Hi everyone, my name's David and it's my privilege to be bringing the Word of God to you today. And I really pray that you're gonna be blessed and inspired, not necessarily because you're gonna hear, hear something new, but because you're gonna hear something true and it's true for you and your heart is gonna resonate with it, it's gonna to respond to it. Come on, let's pray together. Holy Spirit, you're the best teacher. And we pray for more than just another sermon, but a revelation from you. I thank you for every precious person tuning in online right now. May this word be specially designed from your heart to theirs. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I've been uh, preaching now. It's been my privilege to be preaching for over 40 years. And uh, the theme of my ministry has really become wholeness. God wants you whole. His good news to you, His gospel to you, is He wants you a whole person, body, soul and spirit. And I'm often asked, how did you get started on this journey of wholeness? Why have you so landed on this personal message of wholeness? And actually it all began with this verse I'm about to read to you from Matthew's Gospel taken from the message, it says, Jesus speaking, He says, Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Isn't that beautiful? Learning the unforced rhythms of grace I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And so Jesus is describing Christianity to us. He's describing the relationship of how He wants to relate to you and you relating to Him. And as I read this some years ago now, I realised, wow, if that's Christianity, I sure ain't living it. You know, I just did a a quick comparison between the the invitation of Jesus and His description of Christianity and what I was actually experiencing. And I was realising, wow, I'm living something that He's not describing. And so that began a process of me rediscovering some of the foundational truths of Christianity that I drifted away from. And that's what I pray that we're going to discover together today. You know, Jesus simplified Christianity with one dynamic, simple but profound statement in John chapter uh, 15, verse 5. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Wow. So Jesus is reaching into nature and borrowing a metaphor of how a vine and branch relate to one another to try and convey to us this simple and profound relational truth that we have this mystical union, just like a, a vine and a branch have a union and the, and the vine is supplying life to the branch. So it is, Christ is saying, I'm your vine and I'm putting my life, my life-giving sap of my spirit into your life, causing you to bear much fruit, simplified in that one statement and yet so profound. So I like to say Jesus is really saying in this statement, get a life, get a life, get my life flowing into you. And then He says, listen, if you don't do this, Christianity won't only just be difficult, it'll be impossible. It'll be impossible for you. Why? Because the only perfect Christian that ever lived was Christ Himself. And so it's all about getting that life, His life, into us. So that's just a wonderful truth. And this just really began to shift my thinking and recalibrate my Christian journey. So being a Christian is not about 
learning a, a set of behaviours. And so I hand you this book and say, listen, if you learn these behaviours, you'll become a Christian. No, in fact, Jesus is saying, no, this is supernatural. This is a mystical union. There is something supernatural going on here. My Spirit is enabling you to live the benefit of a life that you personally have never lived yourself. Wow. And so let's unpack this together. Let's really learn from what Jesus is bringing uh, to us. You see, the, the vine exists to give life to the branch and it's expressing its life through the branches. A branch doesn't feel pressure to bear fruit on its own because it knows that it's the vine's responsibility to bring to the branch everything it needs to be fruitful. The branch is not isolating itself, saying, oh, I've got to do this all by myself. It is resting in the confidence that the vine is going to bring to it everything it needs to be fruitful. So Jesus is saying to you today, Everybody that you need to meet in order to be fruitful, all the doors you need to open, all the resource you need to have, I'm going to bring it to you, Jesus says. I'm your vine. I'm not going to stand back from your life and demand fruitfulness from you. I'm going to actually bring to you all the resource you need to have to live a fruitful life for my honour and glory. Wow. Wow. And guess what else this is telling us? It's saying that everything that's in the life of the vine is being given to the life of the branch. The vine isn't holding anything back. The same sap that's flowing in the vine is the same sap that's flowing into the branch. You and I are living the benefit of a life we've never actually lived ourselves. And so there's this flow of life coming to us, all that's the victory, the overcoming power that's in the life of Jesus is actually flowing into us. What's true of Him is true of us, not by virtue of anything we've done, but simply by this flow of His Spirit in you. And this is why the Bible presents Christ as the answer to many of our varied needs. It doesn't seem to matter what need uh, you're coming to God with. He just presents Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. One size seems to fit all. Why? Because we're told that Jesus was tempted in every way, just like we are and yet without sin. So this overcoming life, no matter what you're going through, Jesus went through it. Now in His life, uh, in His Spirit is being given to you that very same victory uh, that He conquered uh, for you. So um, just like the vine gives the benefit of its life to the branches, so the Spirit of Jesus brings to you the power and victory of a life that's not your own. Come on, is this blessing you today? It sure is blessing me. All right. So... And this is actually the prophetic message of communion. You know, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And He wasn't meaning that we should get into this morose and morbid remembering of His torture and crucifixion by the Romans. No, He knows that we drift. He knows that we forget. And He's actually bringing us back to this focused connection that we're meant to maintain with Jesus Christ as our vine in our life. He knows the circumstances of life will put pressure on us and we'll be pulled this way and that. And so He's saying, I want you, I'm going to give you something that for you to do repetitively that will keep bringing you back to this basic foundational connection of my life flowing into you. When He, he talked about uh, the cup that was uh, to represent His blood. And then He said, now you drink it. You, you take this into yourself. You see, the Jews understood something about blood. They knew that the life was in the blood. And when Jesus referred to His blood, they knew He wasn't talking about so much His death, but His life. And for Him to be saying, 
take this into you was Him saying, come on, prophesy to yourself afresh that my life is flowing into you. And He alludes to this actually in John 6, 53. He says, if you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you don't have the source of life in you. So this life, that faced every temptation and yet overcome it all, every time we take communion, we are prophesying, rehearsing again, reminding ourselves, that's right, I'm not in this world alone. I'm not abandoned. I'm not an orphan. I'm not just doing life without God. I am a branch. I'm connected to the vine and I'm drawing on His life. Every, every victory that's in this life is now mine. I'm living the benefit of life that I've never actually lived. What's true of Him is true of me because His life flows into me. That's so beautiful. And so communion really is Jesus whispering into your heart. You had a tough week. You know, uh, He's not He's not uh, saying don't come to communion if you've had a tough week. He's saying you've had a tough week, you better take communion because you need to reconnect to the vine. You need to learn again, wow, what you've faced this week, you needed to be drawing on my victory and my life. So Jesus is saying, come on, get a life, my life. He says, you might be saying, this, I just don't have peace in my life. And he says, that's okay, because my peace I give to you. You say, well, I just don't have joy in my life. But he says, no, that's okay, because I've told you these things so that my joy might be in you. Uh, you're feeling overwhelmed with the pressures of life. He said, that's okay, because I have overcome the world. You're feeling broken and useless and, oh God, I just feel like a nobody. And Jesus said, that's okay, because I love to put my life into these earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power might be clearly revealed to be of me and not of you. Wow, we get to live the benefit of a life we've never lived. And that's why the weakest person in your, the room that you're in right now, the weakest person in the room in which you're listening to this message can live the most fruitful life, not because of their anything of their own virtue, but because of the life of the vine uh, that they're already attached to flowing into them. So Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then He tells us, without me, you can do nothing. You know, why aren't we more challenged by what we've just been told by Jesus? He's saying, listen, the life you're attempting to live is impossible without me. Well, you know, somebody should tell Jesus without Him, we do lots of stuff. You know, is He confused? No, He means, yes, without me, you can get results, but uh, it's only with me that you can get this stuff. He's not talking about results. He's talking about fruit. See, as soon as I lift up this bunch of grapes, you know that this didn't come out of a factory. This is, this has come from a life source. I couldn't hold this in my hand if that life source didn't exist. The very proof that this fruit exists means that somewhere there's a life source. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can't get this stuff without me. If you want fruit, sure you can do results, but the only way you can have fruit is to actually uh, come to me. And so, and then he goes on to explain that if we take anything away from its life source, it'll die. A branch separated from a vine, as soon as you do that, you actually kill it. Why? Because you've taken it from its life source. So anything in Christianity, any truth, that you sever from your relational connection to Jesus, you're going to kill it. Prayer, if you sever prayer from your relational connection with Jesus, you've got a dead prayer life. Worship, you, you sever worship from your relational connection to Jesus, it's going to die. So whenever you take a truth and separate it from the truth, the truth being Jesus Christ, you're going to kill that truth. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be evangelism. It could be deeds of obedience. Once we separate 
a truth from the truth, we're actually separated it from its life source and it's actually going to die. And this is just cruel religion when we introduce people to Christianity, emphasising the fruit without first establishing them in the vine, but first giving them the understanding that it's not that Jesus is putting pressure on them to bear fruit. If we read the passage properly, He's emphasising the need to stay connected to Him in order that as a natural outcome, fruit will come to our lives. And so perhaps it's one of the greatest imbalances that we often find in Christianity today, where we're putting the emphasis on the fruit first without first emphasising the relational connection, which makes all the fruit possible. And so sadly, many people have read this passage of Scripture, Vine Branch, John 15, and they've placed the emphasis where Jesus didn't place it. And so they've ended up in a very different place. Jesus is placing the emphasis on abiding, and but people hear Him wrong and they start placing the emphasis on being fruitful. And they hear Him as if He's saying, listen, if you don't perform, if you don't produce fruit, I'm going to reject you. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to push you away from my life. And that's the, the remotest thing that Jesus is actually saying. And so when we don't hear Him right, we end up being driven into a performance-based Christianity instead of this wonderful, beautiful flowing of life that He intended. So what we do is we start gathering Things We start doing prayer, we start doing worship, we start doing Bible reading as an effort to be close to God. And we collect all of this doo-doo and we stand on our doo-doo and we say, look God at all that I've done, surely now I've earned the right to be close to You. Surely here I stand, having done all these things right, surely now because of my fruitfulness, I've earned the right, I deserve to be close to you. Well, guess what? That's flipped the whole thing right around. That's not what Jesus is saying. We can't make the presence of God come closer to us because of our fervency, because it's already established as a grace gift through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So according to Jesus, the Christian faith is not you working for anything. It's working you from, working from what He's actually done for you. We're not to be meant to be using our faith to get God to do stuff for us. We're using our faith to see what God has already done for us and we're responding to that. Think of your faith operating in your life like my eye right now. My eye is not generating light, it's receiving what the light that's already there. It really would mess me up if my own eye was generating light. No, the function of my eye is to receive light. And the function of your faith is to open and see what Christ has done and receive the benefit of it. So I'm not here teaching today to, so you can receive anything from God. I'm just up here trying to reveal what He's already done for you to see what's already available to you in Christ. That's why the Scripture says in Colossians 2.10, in Christ you've been brought to fullness it says in 2 Peter, His divine power has already given you everything you need for life and godliness. So there is no deep secret to living a successful Christian life that only the special people get to have. When we look at the emphasis of Jesus, He's saying, remain in me and I will remain in you. For just as a branch cannot produce fruit of itself, so you can't be fruitful unless you remain in me. Let me just quickly ask you something. If I walked into the room where you are now and I said, now I want you to remain in this room, what am I asking you to do? 
Uh, are you now going to launch into some feverish activity in order to remain in the room? Have you got to think certain thoughts to remain in that room? Have you got to feel certain things to remain in the room? No. Why? You don't have to do any of those things. Why? Because you're already in the room. So in other words, I'm saying, stop striving to be where you already are. Listen, it's possible for you to be in the room, but be so distracted with anxiety and fear and other issues going on in your life that you're not drawing benefit from the room that you're in right now. But nonetheless, even though that you're not experiencing the benefit of being in the room right now, you are still in the room. So stop striving to be where Jesus says you already are. His command to you, His instruction to you is to remain where He's placed you when you got born again. All right. So when we boil it right down as we're trying to land this message together today, a primary thing that we're trying to maintain in our Christian work is not effort, but focus. You know, Jesus again and again brought people back, as I've said, with communion, He brought people back to a focus on not on them, but on Himself. You know, when He was walking to uh, the house of Jairus to raise his daughter from the dead and uh, the, the messenger came, don't bother the master anymore. You know, your daughter is dead. Immediately, Jesus says, don't yield to your fear, have faith in me and she'll live again. In other words, Jesus said, stop focusing there. Keep your focus on me. To the woman at the well, when they were exchanging their dialogue about water, he said, listen, if only you knew who I was, you'd be asking for a lot more than just water right now. See, it was about focus. Because her focus, her revelation of who Jesus was so low, her expectation was so low. Listen, whatever has your focus has you. And one of the enemy's primary works in your life is to actually captivate your focus. He's trying to get your eyes off Jesus Christ. He's trying to tourniquet your life. If I was to take this uh, little strap here and wrap it really tightly around my wrist and pull it really tight after a while, I'd feel this hand begin to tingle and I'd know that the life source of my blood is being cut off. The reason why it's starting to tingle is because it's being poisoned. The life-giving blood, the oxygenated blood from my heart is not getting there. It's not carrying away the toxins uh, to be cleansed in my bloodstream. And so there's many of you listening today and you've been tourniqueted. Unbelief has tourniqueted various aspects of your life. And, it, and there's a buildup of toxic attitudes and emotions, things that Jesus never intended you to have. And I just want to say to you, come on, take that tourniquet of unbelief off those areas. It might be your finance, your marriage, your future, your business, and you need to get that off there. You are not a severed branch. You are connected to the life of the vine. Open yourself to receive the life of the vine you're already connected to. So right now, we're just going to go to a time of worship and what I want you to do is bow your heads, close your eyes with me right now. In Jesus' Name, we are expecting the life and the Spirit of Christ to come rushing into tourniquet areas of your life, areas that you have cut off from the Spirit of God. And as we sing this song, I want you to be very intentional about allowing the Holy Spirit to point to areas of your life where you've been doing life without the flow of Jesus. You've taken different areas of your life. You've connected, you've disconnected them from the life of the vine. And as you begin to take that tourniquet off, begin to feel the rush of the life and Spirit of Jesus bringing victory and overcoming to those areas of your life.